Welcome to this presentation on the book of Revelation. Here we will be looking at chapter 9 and the second half of this chapter. In this chapter we read about the, the sixth trumpet. Uh, each of these trumpets represents uh, events that are taking place on the earth. In the sixth trumpet we read about uh, the Turkish Muslim Empire. It's a continuation on from the previous part of this chapter describing the Arab Muslim Empire earlier on. This, chap this part of the chapter is particularly interesting because, among other things, it appears to describe uh, gunpowder and the uh, arrival of uh, cannon as used in warfare. We'll read through these uh, verses quickly in the King James Bible. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of a golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay uh, the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horsemen in the vision, and them that sat on, sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and they had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So we see here quite clearly that these things are intended as a judgment from from God against the uh, idolatry and the uh, and the false religion that's out there. When we looked at the first half of chapter 9, we also uh, pointed out the verses in Isaiah 56 about how the Lord uh, declared, I'm God and there's none else, I'm God, and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Well, in verse 11 it says, Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. So just as happened previously, uh, uh, in the previous part of this chapter, we uh, read about the man, Muhammad, and through him, uh, this, uh, uh, this army rose up and executed a judgment from God. And now a second thing is happening, this time it's there from the southeast, maybe from the northeast, somewhere in the, uh, in the, in the, in the midst of, of Asia. There came a, uh, a nation that nobody had particularly heard of before. They suddenly came, appeared on the scene, and carried out the, uh, the counsel that, or the purpose that God had declared for it. We also need to remember in, in the end of chapter 8 to talk there about woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by means of the other voices of a trumpet of a three angels which you to sound. There were a total of seven angels. The first four sounded in, in chapter 8. Then uh, we have uh, the fifth angel and the sixth angel sounding here in chapter 9. Now, in this case, it's the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, which is about to face the sound of a sixth trumpet. 
and we call it the Eastern Roman Empire because it was the remnants of what used to be the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. Up until that point, it hadn't actually been conquered. We call it Roman, and they would have called themselves Roman. These days, the name Byzantine is applied to it, but uh, they, uh, they often referred to themselves as Roman, even though their, their capital was in Constantinople and they predominantly spoke Greek, not Latin. And what's a woe? Just in case anyone's in any doubt about this, a woe from the dictionary, a deep distress or misery is from grief, wretchedness, misfortune, calamity, economic and political woes. Synonyms are anguish, tribulation, trial, wretchedness, melancholy. So it's not good. And this bow starts off with the great river Euphrates. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 13, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of a golden altar, which was before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So that's the place where we need to look for the uh, action that's about to take place. In verse 15, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour in the day and the month and the year for to slay the third part of men. Now, when uh, God was executing his judgments on the Roman earth, he uh, applied this to third parts of the ancient world. Uh, the first part was the Western uh, Europe, which was overrun by the Goths and the barbarian tribes. The second part of the ancient world was uh, uh, North Africa and the Middle East, and that was overrun, overrun by the Arabs. And now the final third is uh, Eastern Europe, Turkey, and it's about to be overrun by the Turks. In verse 15, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month, and a year for to slay the third part of men. And we know that in Bible prophecy, uh, one day represents one year, so one month is 30 years, and one year in prophecy represents 160 actual years. And an hour, we don't really know. Perhaps we can, it's difficult to be that precise, but we have a total of 391 years. We also know quite uh, definitely that the end of the Byzantine Empire was in 1453 AD. That's when their, their empire, or what was left of it, came to a sudden end. Subtracting 391 years from that, we come to the date 1062, and we have a place, the, the Euphrates, for the loosing of the four angels. So now we have a date and a place and so we can look to see what was happening in that area at that time. Who was at the Euphrates in the year 1062 AD? If you're looking in the history books for a particular event and particular time uh, in that year, you struggle a little bit. Some people claim that there were events that of significance taking place in, in that region. Uh, but uh, it's very clear that around this time uh, a new people had arrived, that new conquerors, new invaders, they had appeared from this far off land and from the east. And they, they were like, like an eagle flying in. And they assumed the leadership of the Islamic world by establishing political mastery over the pre previous caliphate in, uh, in Baghdad. And the last uh, of the previous rulers uh, uh, came to an end in 1055 AD. He was deposed by the Seljuk Togrul Beg. And in, from 1057 through to 1061, he extended his control throughout what's now modern-day Iraq from Mosul and Basra and put down a revolt in Baghdad. There's a quote here from Encyclopedia Britannica. 
the new arrivals on the western frontier were the Seljuk Turks, whose conquests were to change the whole shape of the Muslim and Byzantine worlds. So this was not uh, some uh, minor skirmish, this was something big. And we know for certain that after 1062 AD, the attacks are underway. Uh, again, and from Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, it says they made their first explorations across the Byzantine frontier into Armenia in 1065 and in 1067 as far west as Caesarea in central Anatolia. The raiders were inspired by the Muslim idea of holy war and there was at first nothing systematic about their invasion. In 1071 AD, uh, they, they won a major battle. The Battle of Manzikert was fought between the Byzantine Empire and the Seljuk Turks, led by the successor to Togrul Beg, named Alp Arslan, on August 26, 1071. It resulted in the, in the defeat of a large Byzantine army and the capture of, a, of the Emperor Romanus IV Diogenes. So this didn't destroy the Byzantine Empire, but it was a major setback in the beginnings of attacks on that empire. Obviously, losing the emperor was a bit of a setback. So, loose the uh, four angels which abound in the great river Euphrates. The great river Euphrates, of course, is in the uh, region of... Uh, of modern-day Iraq or Persia as it was, and the river uh, starts starts flowing all the way in uh, modern-day Turkey. So it seems like a very good description of a geographical location of this uh, uh, sudden conquest. It should be mentioned that in the Old Testament. Uh, Often, uh, when it talked about a uh, river overflowing its banks, it was talking about a nation represented by that uh, river, and it was overflowing its banks, it was invading its neighbours. Revelation 9.16, and the number of the army of horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. Again, Remember that this is symbolic. Don't look for a literal army of 200 million. Um, if, we, uh, if we were to translate that exactly, it would say to myriad, myriad. A myriad being 10,000 in Greek. And what we see here is two successive attackers, the Seljuk Turks and then later on the Ottoman Turks. And they both came in, uh, in large numbers. Revelation 9 and verse 17, and in vision the horses and the riders appeared to me like this. The riders wore breastplates of the color of fiery red and sapphire blue and sulfur yellow. And that's from the Amplified Bible. And one particular thing that you note about uh, uh, soldiers in this time, they often wore quite brightly colored uniforms. And certainly blues and, and reds are very prominent in the uniform maybe yellow as well somewhere. And now we read some verses that appear to be describing gunpowder and cannons. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which had issued out of their mouths for their powers in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and at heads, and with them they do hurt. So out of the mouths of cannons, of course, issued fire and brimstone and smoke. Brimstone is uh, the old name for sulfur, one of the ingredients of gunpowder, and of course the ingredient that smells. 
cannons, of course, produced fire and smoke. It was actually with cannon that they uh, killed this third part of man, the uh, remaining third of the, uh, of the old Roman Empire. Just a few quotes from Encyclopedia Britannica. It says, before gunpowder, uh, artillery are well... Before gunpowder artillery, a well-maintained stone castle secured against the escalade by high curtain walls and flanking towers provided almost unbreachable security against attack. So if you've got a, a large stone wall, if you're in a city with a, with a, that's a well-fortified with huge uh, stone walls, you're safe if you've designed the walls well with towers to uh, enable you to uh, to fire upon all the attackers. However, uh, siege artillery changed all that. The French and the Ottomans were the first to bring siege artillery to bear in a decisive manner outside their own immediate regions. The impact of Ottoman siege artillery was equally dramatic. Sultan Mehmed II breached the walls of Constantinople in 1453 by means of large bombards, bringing the Byzantine Empire to an end and laying the foundations of Ottoman power. The Turks retained their superiority in siegecraft for another generation, levelling the major Phoenician fortifications in southern Greece and marching unhindered through the Balkans before, before being repulsed before Vienna in 1529. So the Turkish uh, Muslim armies got all the way into into Austria, and were at the uh, at the gates of Vienna. So by these three, were a third part of men killed. Now uh, the the east the, the third part was ruled from Constantinople. Originally, it was governed a huge area, the west eastern half of the Roman Empire. It came and went a little bit in size, but by about the 1400s, it was little more than a single city, the city of Constantinople. And wars that had withstood enemies for more than a thousand years fell under bombardment by cannons. And some of your walls were huge, and uh, in most areas they had uh, three sets of walls. Uh, so you get over the first wall, which is relatively small, and then uh, you have to face uh, the archers and whatever else from uh, the people behind the second wall. And then if you get over the second wall, there's yet an even bigger third wall after it. So it was, it was impregnable. And they had complete confidence in the, sec in the security of their walls. But the uh, Ottoman Turks, with their cannons, completely uh, 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 completely destroyed the fortifications. Um, it's worth mentioning that among the artillery, they had what's been described as a super cannon called Basilica, and that measured over 27 feet in length. It's over seven meters, and weighed enough that it reportedly had to be carried disassembled by a team of 60 oxen and an accompanying crew of up to 400 men. Its barrel was 30 inches in diameter and its bronze walls were 8 inches thick. It fired, massive, it fired a massive marble ball that was designed to knock down fortifications in one shot. So this was an enormous gun. It had a range of about a a mile or 1.6 kilometers. Um, the, the cannon got so hot after it had fired that they had to uh, cool it with, with olive oil. Um, obviously they can't use water or the metal will corrode. And uh, because uh, it took so long to cool down the gun, they only had uh, a few shots per day. Um, some people say it was three shots per day, other seven. But because of a large time between firing, it gave the defenders time to rebuild their walls 
after the uh, shots had been fired. But it was a huge uh, psychological impact to have something like that firing at your walls. But on top of that, of course, there were many other smaller, more practical cannons that were also destroying the walls. So eventually, uh, Mehmed II marched into Constantinople with his troops. This is a major event in terms of uh, the history of Europe. It was. It also had a very substantial effect on, uh, uh, as we read about in the following chapter, in chapter ten. But we'll come to that later. And Hagia Sophia, or known as the Church of Holy Wisdom, an Eastern Orthodox Church, is converted into a mosque, and becomes the second most holy place in uh, the Islamic world. First, of course, being Mecca. And For their tails were like unto serpents, and with them they do hurt. And some people have just said maybe that applies to the way the cannons would have looked when you pull them around with horse and cart, uh, but... Uh, but also to a degree in the symbolic sense after the fall of Constantinople. They were still, the bow was still there. It wasn't the end. They were still, uh, uh, the bow was still threatening much of Europe. There were numerous wars trying to extend their territory. There was very harsh treatment of the conquered people. And uh, uh, if you've got any uh, uh, doubts about that, uh, ask anybody from uh, Greece or from uh, the former Yugoslavia or that part of the world and there were also claims of genocide against the Armenian people so these, this really is tales that, that do hurt Ottoman rule over Greece in particular was quite severe the conquered land was parceled out to Ottoman nobles Greek culture declined and outside the church few people were literate Economic hardships included heavy taxes, poll tax, tax on trade, land tax. Non-Muslims were subjected to various forms of discrimination, forced to wear distinctive clothing, not allowed to ride horses. Uh, there was also something called the tribute of children. One in five boys aged 5 to 12 were taken from their families and constructed constructed into janissaries where they were raised as soldiers. This was an elite uh, soldier corps that they were taken as young boys, lived in strict uh, conditions there and trained continuously uh, in their role and they became an elite uh, group of soldiers under the rule of a sultan. And they had the advantage of being non-Muslims so because they were non-Muslims, they were allowed to be uh, uh, carried away and carted off as slaves. As mentioned before, they got as, the, uh, the uh, Turkish armies got as far as Vienna in 1529. The furthest west westward advance into Central Europe of the Ottoman Empire and of all clashes between the armies of Christianity and Islam might be signalled as a battle that finally stemmed the previously unstoppable Turkish forces. Although they continued their conquest of Austrian controlled parts of Hungary afterwards. So around the fifteen twenty nine the unstoppable armies eventually become uh, 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 held from the final conquest of Europe and if Austria had fallen who knows perhaps all of Europe would have become Muslim about a hundred years later there was yet another battle outside Vienna uh, 1683 and this battle marked the turning point in the 300 year struggle between the forces of the central European kingdoms and the Ottoman Empire. And after that time, you could say the Ottoman Empire was starting to dry up. 
and why are all these things happening? So the reason for the woes are explained um, and in Revelation 9 and verse 20, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornication nor of their thefts so this is the reason for the for these woes and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues repented not so just a, a comment there they didn't repent despite all the things that happened to them despite uh, uh, these the, these massive events that were taking place they didn't repent anyone would have thought that with the rise first of all of the Arab Muslims and then the Turkish Muslims and their vast armies and their menace they got the uh, the Arabs got all the way into Spain and France and uh, and uh, the Turkish ones into into uh, Greece and uh, were at the, at the gates of Vienna and yet they didn't repent they repented not of their their idols uh, of their silver and their gold and and all the rest and all the other evil things that they did as well not just the idolatry. We've got a few comments upon these li lines from H.G. Wells. This is talking about the apostasy of the Eastern Empire, describing the Battle of Yarmouk in 636 against the, the Arab armies. And he says, a great parade of priests, uh, sacred banners, pictures and holy relics was made by the Byzantine host. It was further sustained by the chanting of monks but there was no magic in the relics and little conviction about the chanting. The battle became a massacre. The Byzantine army had fought with its back to the river, which was presently choked with its dead. And more comments about image worship from H.G. Wells. Image worship, which came so near to idolatry, was to be prevented by the complete banishment of images from the churches. The emperor hoped to win over the Jews and Mohammedans of the empire to the communion of a church thus purified. One faith, one church was to be the firm bond of union on the empire. With this thought, Leo the Isaurian began the movement. But the power of monasticism and the superstitious needs of a people were stronger and the emperor and his army. So we get here a picture of a of an emperor, a political leader, a ruler of uh, of a land, and he wants to get rid of image worship, to uh, to uh, basically win over the Jews and the and the Muslims, and the uh, the superstitious needs of the people, the uh, the. Uh, uh, the power of monasticism, the, the church, as it was, they were stronger than the emperor and his army. That gives you some idea of how deeply entrenched image worship had become at that time. We also noted uh, the great bishops of Jerusalem, Antioch and Alexandria, with the Bishop of Rome at the head, who are now beyond the power of the emperors, because they're all in areas uh, out, outside of Byzantine control, declared themselves in favor of the worship of images, and this was decisive. A great synod at Nicaea, the Seventh Ecumenical Council in the year 787, decided the victory for the worship dunia of images, which was to be referred to the object of the images, and distinguished from the adoration of God, Latria. Roman as well as Greek Catholicism has ever since firmly uh, has ever since remained firmly by this standpoint. They, they clung on to their idols. They repented not of uh, of uh, their idolatry. 
and it wasn't just H.G. Wells making this point, also Edward Gibbon, another uh, historian. He's someone look, these are people who are looking at things purely from the perspective of history. They're not uh, trying to make some kind of political point or, or score some uh, denominational uh, point, point scoring. They're looking at it purely from history, and they're making these observations. So it's the first introduction of a symbolic worship was in the veneration of a cross and of relics. By a slow though inevitable progression, the honours of the original were transferred to the copy. The devout Christian prayed before the image of a saint, and the pagan rites of genuflection Luminaries and incense again stole into the Catholic Church. The scruples of reason or piety were silenced by the strong evidence of visions and miracles, and the pictures which speak and move and bleed must be endowed with a divine energy and may be considered as the proper objects of a religious adoration. A similar indulgence was requisite and precious for the Virgin Mary. The place of her burial was unknown, and the assumption of her soul and body into heaven was adopted by the credulity of the Greeks and the Latins. The use and even the worship of images was firmly established before the end of the 6th century, uh, written in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And he goes on, the worship of images stolen into church by insensible degrees, and every petty step was pleasing to the superstitious mind as productive of comfort and innocent sin. But in the beginning of the 8th century, in the full magnitude of the abuse, the, the more timorous Greeks were awakened by an apprehension that, under the mask of Christianity, they had restored the religion of their fathers. They heard with grief and impatience the name of idolaters, the incessant charge of the Jews and the Mohammedans who derived from the law and the Quran. So we see here these people, the Mohammedans, the, the Muslim armies, who were there sent by God as a punishment from God, they were saying, you're idolaters. That's according to uh, Edward Gibbon. And yet they repented not of the works of the hand. And still they haven't repented. We see a fairly elaborate Orthodox Christian prayer corner as it might be found in a private home. And uh, a while back uh, there was even one of the precious relics appearing uh, uh, or uh, making its presence felt again, uh, one of the gems of the Vatican's priceless religious art collections, a 6th century reliquary containing the purported fragments of a cross in which Jesus was crucified, has got a new look after being restored to its Byzantine era glory, experts say. The Vatican today will unveil the restored Crux Vaticana, a jewel encrusted golden cross containing what tradition holds as shards of Jesus' cross. Again, idols of silver and brass and stone and wood. And this one's got quite a few of those elements. It's even got the wood in the form of a fragment of a cross, uh, supposedly. Thank you for listening to this presentation.